Grace, that was uh, fascinating and uh, entertaining in equal measure. And uh, I have a modest proposal for you since there's a family record, as I understand. What if you did 201 uh, versions of that speech? We could send you around the country. <laughs> and then you'd hold the Kennan record. Thank you again. Uh, now it's my great pleasure to bring to the stage Susan Carmel. Susan, come on up. Susan has long been a fixture in Washington as a supporter of the arch, arts, but over the last decade plus, she has paid particular attention to supporting artistic and cultural connections between Russia and the United States. She's the founder and advisory committee chair of the Carmel Institute of Russian Culture and History at American University, and we're joined tonight by representatives from the Carmel Institute. Susan is deeply passionate about the power of culture to transform our relationship with Russia and the Russian people in a positive direction. It's a passion that she shared with Jim Billington, and Susan and the Billington family grew very close as a result. I can think of no other individual who has spent more of her time, talent, and treasure to the cause of cultural and academic exchange between Russia and the United States. And so, who better than Susan to talk about Jim's passion for the same? If George Kennan is the author of Containment of Russia, it's my belief that over time, Jim Billington will come to be recognized as the most important proponent of engagement with Russia. Susan, thank you for your support for this evening and your years of work to improve U.S.-Russian cultural relations. Please. Thank you, Matt, and good evening. I am very, very humbled to stand before you tonight to speak about the greatest historian of Russian culture and history in America, as well as our nation's greatest librarian of Congress for 28 years, and the esteemed co-founder of the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center, which Jim Billington led from 1973 to 1987. Dr. James H. Billington was a national treasure, a great American, a devoted husband and father, a teacher, an author, a visionary, a genius and a man of faith. I was honored to call him my dear friend, he and his wonderful wife, Marjorie. Jim's love of family and his faith in God are a key part of the understanding of Jim Billington and his extraordinary legacy. It is said that we learn by standing on the shoulders of giants, but how does one recognize a giant? They're not always tall in height, nor physically strong, nor defined by race, gender, creed, nor wealth. They may be angels that lead us toward a higher understanding, as did Mother Teresa and so many blessed saints. Some are not easily recognized quite often until they leave us. But they do leave us with a path to follow. And Jim Billington, Ambassador George Kennan, and Frederick Starr, in their work, especially in co-founding the Kennan Institute, left us a path to follow that has led and continues to lead toward greater understanding, mutual respect, informed dialogue, and the comprehension of the challenges of the future. The peaceful resolution of conflict and the hope and aspirations of the future lie in our ability to follow the paths of these giants and to absorb their wisdom. The markers they placed as survey stones along the route are there. We simply need to look for them. There is an old Russian proverb that applies to many people, many places, and many eras. It is, the one who leads makes a bridge for others. This is an ideal summary of the life and work of Dr. James Hadley Billington. Building bridges was not only a part of his work, it was his philosophy, his passion, and his way of life. It is now just over one year since Jim left us, and we are honored to have his beloved wife, Marjorie, and members of his family, his children, and his grandchildren here tonight, as they are truly his most precious legacy. I ask for their forgiveness in advance for what will surely be an imperfect and inadequate depiction of Jim's legacy, but one I will attempt with abiding love and respect. How does one honor the achievements of someone who had such an extraordinary impact on our nation, the world, and the many institutions he founded and fostered? 
because Jim's life, his work, his interests, and his accomplishments were so far ranging, it might be impossible to capture his spirit in a single presentation. So instead, I want to focus on one facet of his many contributions, his ability to bring Russians and Americans together to engage with each other, and most importantly, to try to understand one another through cultural exchange and interaction. As Jim often told me, the greatest of changes happen from within, silently, and often with an unexpected suddenness, as a whisper, not a shout. As the founder of the Carmel Institute of Russian Culture and History at American University, which also shares the goal of engagement. I deeply appreciated not only Jim's friendship, but also his guidance and his example. Jim readily shared with me the gift of his wisdom and his expertise, collected and mentally cataloged over a lifetime of experience and experiences. He generously and warmly delighted in sharing what he knew with our students, always participating in our events at the Library of Congress, and often attending our events at the Russian Embassy and elsewhere. As George Weigel, distinguished senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, said in his National Review, tribute to Jim, quote, in him, an aristocracy of the mind coincided with a democracy of the heart, that he wanted everyone to be able to share the treasures of knowledge and understanding that meant so much to him especially those who bore responsibility for the common good in these United States." Unquote. Jim left a tremendous legacy to America, and one of his favorite quotes was from Alexander Pope's essay on man. Honor and shame from no condition rise. Act well your part, for there all the honor lies. And Jim Billington certainly acted well his part. He founded the Kennan Institute, co-founded the Kennedy Institute, seven other new programs at the Wilson Center and the Wilson Quarterly. He founded the Open World Leadership Center, which enabled over 27,000 Eurasian leaders to engage and learn from the democratic process. Many of his signature initiatives at the Library of Congress reflected his keen drive to transmit knowledge. To name just a few, the National Book Festival with First Lady Laura Bush, the World Digital Library, the National Audiovisual Conservation Center, John Kluge Center, Prize for the Study of Humanity, Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song, Junior Fellows Program, Young Leaders Center, the Gateway to Knowledge Program, the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, and the James Madison Council, on which I was honored to serve for many years. I have said it before, if only we had somehow been able to download all of the data in Jim's memory, because he truly seemed to have an unlimited capacity to absorb and retain a vast amount of knowledge. Describing it as encyclopedic is not, we know, an exaggeration. Nonetheless, he did leave us his writings, nine books of uncommon depth and beauty, academically rigorous and yet accessible. Jim is rightly celebrated as one of the nation's best scholars on Russia. His landmark book, The Icon and the Axe, has been described as one of the best histories of Russian culture in any language, including Russian. The critical praise heralded it as bold and brilliant, rich and readable, a groundbreaking achievement. But think about this book for a moment. Traditional histories focus on le great leaders, on wars, on revolutions. Jim's seminal work instead blended and synthesized Russian culture, politics, orthodoxy, and into a life, intellectual life together in a seamless narrative. Reading or listening to Jim, you always came away with a deeper understanding of Russia itself not simply a collection of key dates and individuals long since past. This was history that was alive, not dusty and archaic, but still vibrant and vital, informing and shaping the events of our modern lives. His secret, we might say, was his method, which he once reflected upon in an interview. This was an interview with my institute Quote, that's the great secret of cultural history. 
which is already my track and trade. That is, you can't truly understand it if you can't get inside the time, the place, the circumstances under which people create. For Jim, it was impossible to do cultural history without historical context, but the opposite also held just as true for him. You couldn't possibly understand the great movements of history and nations without first understanding their culture. Jim loved poetry, and a poem he often quoted was by George Santayana. Quote, it is not wisdom to be only wise, and on the inward vision close the eyes, but it is wisdom to believe the heart, unquote. For Jim, culture was the driving creative force of civilization, a force which, if ignored, could imperil peace. In 1997, Jim told the Foreign Policy Research Institute, quote, the task of deeper cultural understanding may be the most important imperative of all for avoiding international conflict in the 21st century, unquote. For anyone who might regard that as an overestimation, Jim added these observations, quote, the human desire almost everywhere to preserve and even to reassert distinct and separate cultural identities might potentially create new divisions and ethnic conflicts capable of tearing the world apart. By contrast, cultural riches of music and art promised to inspire and draw the world closer together. If Americans cannot penetrate the interior spiritual dialogue of other peoples, they will never be able to understand, let alone anticipate or affect the discontinuous major changes which are the driving forces in history and which will probably continue to spring unexpected traps in the years ahead. To put it another way, if we cannot learn to listen to others as they whisper their prayers, we may well confront them later when they howl their war cries, end quote. It is a message we must keep repeating until the lesson is learned. This holistic approach, this insistence upon seeing the whole of a culture and a people, and not just a part, was the distinct outlook that Jim brought with him when he came to the Wilson Center. He came with a mission to establish a national center for the study of Russia, one that would have as its focus the examination of Russia writ large, not the narrow headlines of the day. As Jim once said in a joint Kennan Institute, Carmel Institute forum, marking the anniversary of the publication of the Icon and the Acts, quote, the best thing you can do is something we've never really done. And that is to understand the people of the country, to better understand them by not only what they've written, but by what they've created, what they've done themselves. To better understand that, you have to think beyond what is the headline today and to what is the prospect that tomorrow can still be better than yesterday." Unquote. The Kennan Institute is the result of that lifelong mission, and it is still going strong 45 years later. It is a force for deeper and informed understanding, an essential tool given the current global climate. Certainly, the world was complex at the time of the Institute's founding. But now, we also live in a complex era of superficial understanding. Fueled by the rise of social media, we are endangered by stereotypical thinking, relying on the quickest and easiest answers, or the one that confirms our own viewpoint while closing the door to any other. That is why the work of the Kennan Institute is more important now than ever. Solid scholarship and informed dialogue 
of the type the Kennan Institute encourages and promotes is the essential antidote to this very dangerous trend. Let me also say that the United States was indeed fortunate to have Jim Billington in office as the Librarian of Congress in the closing days of the Cold War and the birth of newly independent Russia. He used that post to teach the public and policymaker alike, traveling with 10 congressional delegations to Russia and the former Soviet Union. Whether it was narrating a popular TV series on Russia, as he did with the face of Russia, or leading congressional delegations to Moscow, Jim was always first and foremost a teacher, but he was also a great listener. In the joint symposium with the Carmel Institute and Kennan Institute on his seminal work, Icon and the Axe, he stated, history is about people. It's not about big data or anything else. It's about people and it's the stories they tell you because they get inside you and affect you. That's affect. What stays with you is only what affects you. And the important questions you can only truly understand if you realize that history is about people, not about abstract theories or about abstract concepts or ways of talking about it, but it's about extending yourself into the lives of others." Unquote. Returning to the concept with which I open these remarks, building bridges, an important and recurring theme with Jim Billington, Jim said this in 1997. Quote, even if cultural gaps cannot be bridged, one becomes a better person and more appreciative of one's own culture by the very attempt to understand someone else's, unquote. No attempt to build a bridge to span a cultural gap is ever a wasted effort. However incrementally, such efforts hopefully can and do in the fullness of time bring people, nations, and yes, the world closer together. So let us keep building those bridges. Jim would want us to do so. And it is, I think, the very best way that we can honor a life so well lived. God bless Jim Billington and his legacy. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of Jim's tribute and enduring legacy at the Kennan Institute tonight. And my congratulations on your 45th Anniversary, Sijon Razdinia. Bojoyes Vesiba.